Welcome to a very special live edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and I'm pleased and honored to have our guest on the show today. She is the current member of the Legislative Assembly for Chestermere Strathmore. She is currently running to be the next leader of the United Conservative Party and ultimately the next Premier of Alberta. She is a former guest of the show, Leela Ahir. Leela, thank you so much for doing this, taking time out of your busy day to sit down with us and chat about your campaign, about your vision, and also about the uh, what's next for Alberta. So thank you. Well, thank you, Chris. I'm absolutely honored and privileged to be with you today and to be able to spend time with you. And I think I lost my picture here. Hold on one second. Let me see if I can find you again. We Not can sure what just see happened. you, though. <laughs> Yay! There we go. Now I got you back. There so I'm just go. outside. I'm in, I'm in Strathmore right now. Um, we just had a town hall because we're on our membership drive. So I'm outside of this wonderful place called PJ's Diner in Strathmore. It's the family that uh, owns it and the, t and the folks that own it are just like staples in the community. They give so much back. So it's been wonderful hanging out with local folks here this morning. Well, I, I'm glad to hear that. And like I said, we won't take too much of your time because we want to make sure you get back to your campaign. But uh, okay. I have started off all my interviews the exact same way. We did it in uh, in December when we first had you on. Let's see if the answer has changed any bit since that last time we, you had you were on the show. Where does your sense of duty to serve come from, Leela? I'm, I'm compelled to give back. The province has given me so much, Chris. Like I, I, my dad came from India in 1962 and he was adopted by this cute little family, you know, that um, adopted all of these like Southeast Asian boys that came off the airplane that brought them into Alberta culture. And my entire life and the life that I leave, lead, which is spectacular and blessed in so many different ways um, is because of the province that I live in and, and all of the things that I've benefited from in this province. And I want that for these future generations. I want to be part of that. I want to lay a pathway and to show this next group of kids. Like if you think about everything we've been through in the last little while, there's never been a more critical and important time to show unity and strength and compassion and that Alberta resilience, that thing that that is just a driver of our province, right? And I've lived and grown up and breathed and eat and sleep that, you know, that's that's who I am. I'm I'm bred in this province. I I love I love who we are in the tapestry and who and the this beautiful fabric that's been created by, you know, new Canadians. We have Ukrainian refugees coming in right now, people who are forced to leave their home to come to a new home where we can love them and understand and bring them into our culture to somebody else who came for a job to fifth generation farmer to our indigenous peoples, right? This, this, this is a spectacular place. And I just want to be part of it. I want to grow it. I want to unify. I want to bring people together in the way that I understand Alberta to be and the vision that I think that most of us have, which is that of collaboration and working together. So which is an alt a great way to jump off into this interview about your leadership and why you're running for the leadership. Mm -hmm. um, there is a, uh, a swath of issues that are facing Albertans today, whether it be inflation, whether it be jobs, whether it be uh, uh, fighting Alberta or Ottawa, as some candidates are saying. What makes you want to be premier? What makes you believe you are the best person to unify Alberta's, to bring this province together, to move it forward in a unified fashion, but also not leave people behind because people are struggling and they need some hope. What are you giving them hope for? I don't have a, I have no ulterior motive, right? There's, there's no agenda for me other than to give you something you'd be proud of, Chris. Like I, I believe unity is not something that you that you have. You have to you have to earn that. And the way that governments are supposed to look, in my opinion, and I've been elected for seven years, so I have some skin in the game here. The what the thing, and I've been you know over those years, you you get a lot of humble pie. So I come into this from a very I'm, I'm coming at this from a very humble lens. So my my entire premise. Is to, is to help build that strong foundation because your premier, your cabinet and your caucus are supposed to be the foundation. And, and right now it's so top down, like it's just topsy turvy and it doesn't matter what political party you're in. It's that toxic notion of top down politics and that we know better than you do. The truth of it is, is that 
our responsibility is to build you a strong foundation so you're standing on our shoulders, not the other way around. And for far too long, we have we're, we're using our opportunities to divide. Like, for example, you know, in the last three years, I, I think I was really blessed because being the Minister of Culture, Multiculturalism and Status of Women, I saw the best of people, right? You saw whether it was faith organizations or community organizations or various groups that were doing everything possible to make sure um, that there was places for people to sleep if they had COVID or that spaces were open for them to come and get food or dropping off baskets or making sure that somebody had milk if they couldn't leave their house or walk their dog. Like I just saw one beautiful act after another. And I was really, I don't know, to say I was touched is an understatement. Like it was just magnificent to see the typical Alberta spirit, how we rally together. The, where I think what compels me to participate is that spirit, because instead of capitalizing on that strength and that spirit, our politicians, our leadership, and I've, I'm, I mean, I'm part of this, so I take responsibility for this too. We use the people of this province in a ground war between the left and right, and you become collateral damage in a, in a war that's not yours to fight because politics is always built on division, not unification. The winning of a team in politics, regardless of what party you're in, is because somebody's bad, not because somebody's good. You know, it's a replacement. It's, a, it's, not, a, it's not two competing excellent ideas and you pick the best ideas from the person who brings you forward. It's politicized and polarized. And so what I bring to the table that is uniquely different is that I'm not an ideological politician. I've made mistakes, certainly, in my, well, you know, my voting record, you know, the things that I've done and said and things that I've, I've certainly made errors in. But the opportunity to have a second chance to be able to build up because, you know, you know, ultimately where you've gone wrong and where you've gone right. Right. There's it's a tremendously different position than saying I'm right about this. I'm going to push a polarize, polarization. I'm going to use you to divide, right? I, I'm not ideological. So I'm looking for all hands on deck for good policy. You know, you don't need 800 pieces of policy. You need good pieces of policy that are in the best interest of Albertans, not ideological um, bent that literally you are using the emotions and the, and the, and the people around you in order to forage your own agenda. That's what is uniquely different about the position that I'm taking is that I'm not interested. I will work with whoever. I'm super happy. And I'm a diplomat, right? Like that's where, that's where I come from is, is diplomacy. When you're, when you are working in culture or you're working with our indigenous, our indigenous, the, the, the indigenous, I shouldn't say our, sorry, pardon me, but the indigenous families, right? That are, have been here since time immemorial. There's wisdom and strength and power in those conversations that you have that actually help you build. Like if you look at reconciliation just as a, as a theme in our culture too, like in the Southeast Asian culture, it's like that as well too. You have really difficult and weedy discussions where your elders literally yell at you for an hour telling you how bad you are and everything you've done wrong in my culture, right? And then you start from there and you don't get offended because these people have had some time on earth. They have wisdom that they're trying to impart upon you to help you understand how you can be better when you come about it from that that humble position and a space where you are not the smartest person in the room and you're willing to surround yourself with people who are smarter and have wisdom about not only the social and emotional aspect but are really really the academia of the policy that you're talking about is really around how it is that you how it is that you implement it implementation is about marketing right it's about making sure that like if you're unifying your caucus that you've talked about it ad nauseum right that there is consensus building and when you consensus build with your caucus you're also consensus building with your partners outside of caucus because you get validators you get people that come that aren't just ideological people that you know they're just behind you because you happen to be the premier or whatever they've come to you because they want to make Alberta better you're not run by you know special interest groups you're not run like our little team Chris do you want to, you, you know, my campaign manager, Sarah Biggs, right? Yep. Sarah and I are like sisters, right? Our, our little team is family. The people who are volunteering and working on my team are people that I've volunteered with for like a hundred years in my community. They're not in it for the politics. They're in it to build their community. So if you're in it as a community builder, you know, like 
We'll take EMS as an example right now. What a schmozzle, right? But whose fault is it? You can't point fingers at people. This isn't a fault related thing. We've had these issues for years. So how is it that we look at the systemic and structural issues that are in this situation in order to do better by Albertans? Do you point fingers at each other? Do you yell at each other? Well, that government did this. That, government. that doesn't help the people who are waiting for an ambulance right now in a zone where it's a red zone. How, how does that help? All it does is that you build fear with people versus looking at the situation because it's the human capital that matters, right? You can have as many beds as you want. You can have as many ambulances as you want. That's not going to matter if they're sitting, like in my riding, we have ambulances that sit empty because we don't have staff, not because we need it, not because we need an ambulance, but because our AMS guys are exhausted. These guys and gals out here are exhausted, okay? And how is it then that you bring people into the system as quickly as possible to be able to build that system up. You don't do it by yelling at each other and assuming that a person has a nefarious um, intention of making sure you don't have an ambulance. That's not how you build community, Chris. And this goes right across party lines. This is not a UCP or an NDP thing. We're all guilty of this. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15-second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Hey everyone, we're back. Sorry about that. We've had a bit of a hiccup. Uh, the great thing about Alberta summer is it gets hot and does overcharge our phones from time to time. But Leela is back with us. We, we were talking about uh, cross party lines here, but I want to jump into something a little bit different here for a second, if you're okay with that, because I'm assuming you are. There are a lot of different communities in this province, whether it be uh, uh, religious, whether it be cultural, whether it be just communities in general like Slave Lake, Lethbridge, uh, Fort McMurray, you name it, everywhere in between. How do you unify a province that is so divided where rural communities are upset with urban communities, urban communities are upset with rural communities because we don't get the funding like the rural communities or the urban communities do or urban cities do compared to my small town, which has 10,000 people in it and we need that funding. How do you bring together a province that is so rural urban divide right now? So a couple of, one of the things we were thinking about, like if we are privileged to win this is to have two deputy premiers, one urban and one rural. And the entire purpose of that would be not just to focus on the rural and urban issues, but it actually in building consensus and friendship amongst those lines. Cause really we're, we're a lot closer than we are divided. But the problem is, is like normal, there's insular issues that don't, don't ever get discussed. And because people are so worried about their political careers and not actually what's in the best interest of the province, things get leveraged for those reasons right and it ha again it happens everywhere but if we're able to actually build um if you consider it like I, I look at edmonton for example in your surrounding areas right you have all of these small microcosms of you know small cities and, and communities that surround edmonton but you have a really great um communication amongst those cities in order to like talk about infrastructure or common needs and one of the biggest underutilized gems in our province chris is our municipal elected leaders. These people are an expression of the provincial government. We, we don't build consensus with these people. They're, they've become adversaries to governments versus actually working in conjunction. And if we actually engage more with our municipal partners because they're the eyes and ears for us in our municipal and they're elected officials. So building that unity and having those two premiers to be able to really, really intensely deal and work with those communities. Because when we're looking at dollars and spreading them out across communities, it's hard, right? Because you say yes to some stuff and no to others. But if you're able to justify that based on your capital plans and on building, I think it's a lot easier because you're giving people a heads up. There's absolutely no reason with budgets like what we have in Alberta that we can't give you a one year, five year, 10 year plan. Like, like look at education, for example, right? Um, we should be able to, based on enrollment growth, inflation, and all of the things, and, and population growth, give you an honest idea of what that needs to look like for cost. It, it shouldn't be a rural, um, rural urban divide. It should be based on actual growth, right? And austerity should never impact the education of our children. Like we need to be able to hedge that stuff out and have a plan 
to be, I mean, how long have the teachers and ATA and the ASBA and all these are, they've been telling us this for a hundred years, right? But until you actually dive into it to figure out, you know, anybody who knows anything about a business, you run it like a business and you give people heads up. There's a transparency issue, right? Because you're always, you're always reacting to the necessities of what's happening at the time versus actually giving a plan that helps us to understand where we're going and how we're getting there. And then if changes need to be made, that can happen. But the other thing is too, is that it comes into the entire thing around politics. It's about division again. You're voting based on division versus unification and how it is that we're together. We're, none of us are feasible without the other. There is no food on your table without our farmers. And there is no growth without our cities. And if we work collaboratively together, um, I, there, there's nothing that we can't accomplish actually. One of the, uh, how do I put this correctly? One thing that a lot of people are talking about right now is the justice system. And I'm, I'm doing this whole series that's going to be coming out later in September about rural crime and the issues that are around it, particularly with the Alberta police force that has been proposed by Jason Kenney and the, uh, yeah. uh, the, the UCP government. You talk about utilizing the... Uh, the uh, municipal leaders there and you and I have talked about this way back at your launch here in Calgary where the municipal leaders are saying no we don't want it we like our RCMP we enjoy it um, how do you how do you change that up because it seems like we have a government who's going for it with it you're part of that government but you're saying let's hold off let's wait for two seconds are you advocating for that in caucus right now? Because I know there's the, the UCP, the government has just announced a website and you're saying let's hold off because let's talk to our stakeholders. Chris, I would have had to have been asked in the first place. This is the problem. These are top down discussions that are not even, you remember I was talking about building unity and, and working with caucus to build consensus. This is where I came up. I mean, this is like the most natural thing in the whole world is to build consensus because you do the work. How many municipalities right now have said no to um, a, a provincial government? You want to know why? Because we don't know how much it's going to cost. What about the training centers? And I go back to the same thing about EMS. There are human, this human capital. You, you, can, you can't just change the name of a, of a institution that has structural and systemic issues. We all know about the structural and systemic issues that are in justice and in policing. Tons and tons and tons of issues from everything from the 2S LGBTQ, 2S community, to ethnic communities, to women, to domestic violence, to you know, social work within those programs, to you know, what are the RCMP responsible for, or the policing responsible? Like, I, I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on to um, how the system has so many systemic issues, right? We could talk about, we could write a book about those issues. Changing the name is not going to fix those problems. It's not. And on top of that, where are you going to get the manpower from? Chris, do you remember when we were kids, like the, the, when, when you talked about somebody becoming a Mountie, there was people lined up around the streets to become Mounties. You can, you have to incentivize and pay people to become Mounties nowadays because of the way that we undermine our systems and the way that we don't work collaboratively. Like if you look at, at communities, underrepresented communities, just generally speaking across the province, that the, the actual people who are on the ground who want to make a difference, who are working in diversity inclusion in particular, are looking at the cultural sensitivities. But that's not ever brought to light. Instead, we're fighting over race-based data. Well, race-based data is a piece of it, but race-based data can be used in negative ways if it's not interpreted correctly. So instead of actually talking about anti-racism committees, that when you go into an Islamic home, women are have removed their hijabs in their houses if there's a problem in that and and a police person goes storming in to a house like that where a woman is not wearing her hijab you might as well have caught a woman in the shower this is how traumatic it is for a family like that these cultural responses and understanding the communities that we are working with that's the work that needs to be done those are the things that we need to be focused on so that when you're actually forwarding justice do you understand the communities that you're working with? I'm so unbelievably sick and tired of the rhetoric and the nastiness that goes on when we're not actually dealing with fundamental problems. You want to know what the fundamental problem is in injustice? Is the fact that of, is domestic violence and violence against women in particular. When you can violate another person based on their sexuality or who they are or, the, or their gender, the entire system breaks down because we've already lost, we've already lost the humanity and all of that. And I, I, I will not budge from figuring out the fundamental issues before we go into deciding what the name of our police force is going to be. Um, 
Sorry, I have lots of feelings. It sounds like it. And I'm going to play a little bit of a devil's advocate with you here for a second, because I I follow Twitter as much as it's a microcosm of what society is. And it's a vacuum of people spewing hate and vile every day. Um, There has been concerns of this government, the UCP government and the uh, gay straight alliances in schools, uh, a vote that was taken Mm -hmm. earlier on. I saw your response to that, but I want to get you on the record and put it out. And so in verbs, because I I, words on a text tweet does not mean anything to me until you actually say it. Um, Was this a bad, bad vote for the UCP about not enshrining gay straight alliances within uh, the Education Act? Actually, I wanted it enshrined. So I fought very hard to get them enshrined because that's the only way legislation has any power, right? It, it's the strongest legislation in Canada. But did we get it 100% correct? Not even close. There's so many tweaks and things that we can change. I'm 100% willing to do that, whether that's changing the language to immediately, to making sure, like the problem was what Jason Kenney said right after that legislation, which can, which is in complete contradiction to the legislation. He said something about how that if a child had suicidal ideations, that it was imperative that we uh, uh, tell the parents of that, that they're in a GSA. That has nothing to do with the group that they're part of. The GSA or any other group, the teachers already have a duty to care. They have that responsibility already to let a parent know. Who cares what group they're in? And that conflation and those words that came out of his mouth completely messed with the legislation that was actually being there. There's still things that we can tweak, and I'm 100% all in and fixing that. We can take a new fountain picture, whatever needs to happen to make sure that our kids and our families and people who are allies and friends of our 2S LGBTQ, 2S community understand where I come from. And those, I'm 100% in on fixing and tweaking and organizing around that. But I'll also tell you this much, Chris, when the NDP brought in their legislation and they opened that back door for anybody to be able to come into a GSA, that means that anybody who, you could have a far right wing person who believes in conversion therapy to a predator come into a a place where children are vulnerable. And I was never ever gonna vote for that. And I told them that in the legislation. And I said, if you can remove that one piece, I know that you've heard me say this before. If you could remove that piece from your legislation i'm all in i would have 100 percent voted it for that legislation against my caucus but instead they chose to keep doing this performative action to allow in the in the in the legislation to allow this back door for people to come into our children who are in a vulnerable situation that need to be able to find ways to come out and be the the best human that they can be and and whoever they are to to be able to believe and trust in the human that is being created there and they would not listen to any reasonable responses or amendments that I could bring forward so I abstained from that legislation I did not vote against it I abstained for that reason because they would not listen I had several conversations about this and I'm sure you know that because you're you're involved my, my, with, with my, that. my husband was uh, a member for transparency sake everyone yes. knows my husband was ricardo miranda the first gay cabinet minister in alberta we got married yes. so on and so forth so yes i i I, when, I, kn- I know all this yeah you're and one of my favorite people I, I love ricardo and we had a very good relationship throughout this and and i know that he understands why i did this which is why you don't see him out there politicizing this because he understands he was the legislation that the NDP was brought in was almost perfect. And if they could have changed that one piece and made sure that our children were actually protected, there's no way that you can allow just anybody come in to a children's group on a school campus without making sure that they're there for the right intentions. And I don't believe that that anybody had bad intentions. But when this is brought up, you need to take that into consideration. Where we messed up on our side is that instead of stating the legislation for what it was, we had the premier conflating two completely separate ideas, justifying the reason for not like for telling parents that their kids were in a GSA when the actual legislation says you cannot do that. So obviously there was an ideological bent there. The, the biggest problem that we had, Chris, is that we did not defend the position that we should have in order to make people and families feel safe about the legislation that was there. That's where I, that's was my fault entirely not not coming forward with a strong statement about why right 
I want to turn to an important topic to myself, and this is this is this is off the social issues, and we're going to go on to the economic issues now. I'm a small okay. business owner. I I have been struggling. We have had contracts closed down for the last two years because of COVID nineteen. What policies are you putting out forward to? ensure that small businesses which all politicians will go out and say small businesses are the backbone of our society they're the backbone <laughs> of our economy but when it comes to elections small businesses seem to be forgotten how are you going to help small businesses a thrive but also start up here in alberta because we always pride ourselves on being the economic capital of canada so let's do it let's allow small yeah. businesses to get going so what are you putting forward to help small businesses so there's a couple of things, actually, like, you know, like when you start a small business right now, there's a cap on the taxation of 500,000, right? We want to raise that cap to 750,000. We still have to parse this out. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying something to you that I need to consult on more, but I don't mind sharing it because I would love feedback from people for sure. You're never going to hear a Leela, your government is going to do this. No, we're going to consult with small businesses to see. So, but that would be for new businesses, not one that are already up and running for the ones that are already up and running and that are struggling right now. Some of the biggest problems that we have is in the way that banking loans and the way that the dollars are being forwarded into companies, especially ones that are struggling at this point in time. So we've reached out to several banking associations and organizations to see if there's some way that funding, like if there can be funding halt, like holidays on tax, like on 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 the um, on the dollars that you're owing or forward or moving it. This is also a federal issue as well, too, as you know, to look at how we do this. The problem is, is that. As you know, in COVID, the dollars that were forwarded to you all had to be paid back. And there was not enough information on how that was going to happen or when. And now suddenly you're faced not only with, you know, the substantial amount of debt from not being able to have your businesses running, but also on top of that, paying back government loans and and, um, and other things like whether or not that was for your rentals or, or anything like that. So we're clearly looking at a, a, a multi-level issue. A lot of businesses have come to us and said that even if there was like, um, like a, a holiday, a tax holiday, looking at how we could help, because even that would help for businesses to forward how it is that they're moving. But the other thing is a labor shortage, as you know, huge labor shortage if we're looking at restaurant tourism. And the question that I put to you, because Chris, I don't have an answer for this. I wish I had like a magic wand, is how do we as small businesses empower young people in particular, because that's where there's a huge deficit of work right now, even though we have lots of jobs, how do we empower them to get back into the workforce? Like, what is it that we're missing? And what can we do to help you, I guess, would be to help empower those kids. Because right now, you know, starting off at minimum wage is what we all did, right? We jumped off at minimum wage, we worked our way up the ladder, and then went into usually quite often small businesses on our own. But we've lost that magic somehow with that entrepreneurial spirit. So I think there are ways that we can engage with entrepreneurial spirit by changing that that tax piece of like raising the cap to $750,000. But we also have to figure out a way collectively in our communities, how we get our, our youth and even people who haven't maybe worked in a field before back into the working into the workforce, because I'm sure you're facing the same things that lots are not only labor shortage, but interest in working in these fields and working your way up. So there's an entire work ethic and piece of that that we're, we're missing fundamentally on inspiring the people of our province to get into these jobs or into a workforce there's mental health issues there's issues of you know lost jobs um, opioid crisis lots of things that are contributing so when we look at the mental health side of things to make sure that we have adequate supports and again this isn't about beds this is about human human capital to make sure we're getting people into the best spaces that they can so that they're looking forward to having a job they see the future of their province so so many things that i could talk about that are related um, i also think that there's a tremendous opportunity within the banking systems now to look at vector capitalism and angel capitalism. So microloans, right? Those microloans at one or 2% make it incredibly, um, um, there's, there's a tremendous opportunity when you're only paying one or 2% back, maybe over a year or two, to be able to really get your business up and running. And the interesting thing about that is that that money recycles back to the system and then goes to another new business owner. And particularly if you've lost a business, if you are in crisis in your business, if you need a hand up at this point in time to get things going, those loans are a lot more easy to manage. So part of, part of what we're looking into is there's infrastructure that it already exists in order to do those micro loans. So working with people like Momentum and other ATB, other people who have infrastructure, you don't want government running your micro loans ever. But 
but government would could be involved in helping to aid in all of that. But again, these are these are really these are ideas that have come from wonderful people. I wish I could take credit for it, but we really have to parse it out and see how the government would help, how we would pay for that. Because in all honesty, I need to be able to give you like a white paper, right? Saying this is the idea, this is how we're gonna pay for it. Are you okay with that? Because you're the taxpayer. I'm simply a steward of your taxpayer dollars. So we had a question come in via YouTube. So I'm just gonna ask it. It's it's off the cuff here. I hope you're okay with that. Uh, they want yeah, to know your absolutely. position around cryptocurrency because we see a federal government uh, party leader talking about it have you even thought about this issue is it something that's even in your wheelhouse or is it something that you'd be interested to look at if people were interested in talking about it so the, I think cryptocurrency, unfortunately, has been politicized. It's another thing. It's kind of like pipelines, right? Anything that you're looking at, whether it's currency, whether it is um, any of these businesses, like carbon tax is sort of the same thing. It's this thing that exists but doesn't, you can't see it. It's not tangible, right? You have to have a better system of transparency. The issue that's in cryptocurrency right now is lack of transparency. You have all of these people buying in. People have lost tons of money on it. I don't know, and I, I'm, I'm kind of speaking from... Um, as, a, as an MLA and, of course, as a minister, we're not allowed to have investments. We're not allowed to participate in those kinds of things, and we're in blind trust. So I'm coming at this from uh, purely having read into the system and not having participated. Um, my biggest issue with anything like this is the, is the accountabilities and the transparencies. So if there's a way for the system to show transparently how that money is moving, right now there's a lot of people who are invested in it that have money in it that are having access to information that others are not who are in the ground level of trying to get involved in this. So there's a lot more smarter people than me, I think, Chris, that could probably answer this better. But at this point in time, I don't have a required knowledge in order to be able to say whether I'm for or against. But I can tell you this much. Um, the people who have uh, significantly been had concerns about this have really good concerns because we don't have the information to be able to say as a government this is how we're going to manage it this is what we're looking at to make sure that there's transparency in the system this is how we're going to make sure that you understand your dividends like, there's just not enough information out there and it's I, I get it's new there's lots of people who are interested but there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be covered there before I would be saying yeah go and invest in cryptocurrency I just don't think I'm there yet so my last uh, topic that I want to talk about is inflation. And I think, you know, as you crisscross this province, you are hearing probably from Albertans from, co uh, uh, from corner to corner to corner that they're struggling. People are struggling right now. The cost of food is going up. The cost of uh, gas was going up. It seems to be declining right now, but it is still high. We can't wait till October till uh, a premier here is a, a sworn in. We can't wait till October until the next leader is sworn in. We need solutions now. Um, while it's a federal issue as well, we need someone who's going to be able to work with the federal government on this yeah. issue to help fight the increasing inflation rates that we are seeing at the grocery stores and from all sectors. How do you work? How do you work with a, a federal government like Justin Trudeau or Pierre Polyev, if he becomes the next prime minister, to address these issues? Because we need some hope. And I keep on bring bringing back to that hope message, but we need hope yeah. that these prices are going to be going down because my my salary isn't going up as fast as the prices are going up. I know. So you just, you nailed the answer to the question is the collaboration. Um, right now we have governments working insularly. We knew that this was coming and nobody was, nobody planned for it. We knew that it was coming. We knew that based on CERB and dollars that had gone in, even in our own province, dollars that had gone into situations where you're not, the banks were telling us that this was going to happen. The fact that no government was ready to be able to handle this crisis to at the very least look at how it is that we can give some short term relief is a is something that all of us are going to have to live with at this point in time because of the lack of, of um forward planning because if you the only way to handle something like this believe it or not is to stop spending because it it ultimately brings prices down when you're working in in a deficit of um of uh product and uh you have the the war in ukraine going on so gas prices are shooting through the roof right now you have all of these combinations of things that any government within 
within earshot right now should know that nothing is ever normal. The, the way that the world works is that there's always going to be a crisis. There's always a situation and there's no planning for the future, Chris, none. So right now, like in our province, and this isn't going to help out immediately, but in our province, like we have $14 billion potentially coming in in the next go round. Well, some of that money needs to be spent on services and doing exactly what you're saying, helping out the people. I haven't come up exactly with a perfect plan. I don't think giving checks to people is the right thing. I don't think any of that. It costs more for us to write a check to you than actually like doing a tax cap or helping you immediately in your pocketbook. It's the same thing with the gas tax that you're going to get on your bill right now. So much money is going into the booklet that was written in order to give you $50 back on your natural gas. God knows how much money is actually going to be saved in the whole thing. But but the truth is, is that putting money back into your pockets, either through reduction in tax, whatever it is, depending on your socioeconomic too, because that's also going to be relative to how it is that that money is going to help you. But with the federal government, I'm all in, in collaboration and working. I'm a diplomat. Like that's my job. I don't care who the president, I don't care who the prime minister is. I don't care. I don't care what party you run for. I don't care. Um, you're going to get a little love of Alberta every single day of your life. And I'm going to be persistent in that. I'm not backing down at all from help, helping people understand that we are the economic driver of Canada and that when you help out Albertans, you help out Can Canadians. And you have to take a look at how the people in our province are suffering at this point in time in order to make sure that we build this collaboration across Canada in Confederation. Because the minute that right now everything is about Who's divided with who? Who can I say bad things about? How is it that I get involved in order to make myself feel better by pointing fingers and yelling into the air? None of that's happening. And the average person, you and me and everybody else is the one that's taking the hit for it. So there is an absolute reckoning and a, and a come to whatever God you believe in moment that has to happen here in order for people to see the human content here and the human the human suffering and the human loss. Any government that is not willing to look at that is not worth their solving, does not deserve to lead you in any capacity. So you brought it up. I'm going to ask the question because I think a lot of people are probably wondering where your stance is. Uh, Danielle Smith has proposed a sovereignty act, which would be, uh, which would fly, which would be a tool that she has said to fight against Ottawa's overreach. What's your opinion on this? And do you think it's a, uh, a legal remedy that people could, or the province could use if you were premier? No, I, and I'm just going to be pragmatic because, um, the constitution it's basically a redundant copy of the constitution so the the constitution already has a tremendous amount of opportunities for massive wins for us if we're if we're following through and it's not just about going to court over constitutional concerns it's actually about leveraging the strength of the constitution and involving our players right across the country right because you need 70 percent of the premiers to change anything in the constitution anyway so what are you going to suddenly say no <laughs> You know, I, 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 as much as I would love to believe that's possible, um, I look, I look to, you know, when Lougheed was was our premier here, just to give an example, right? This was in the days of conventional oil and gas, right? And so he was up against Joe Clark, who, you know, was trying to take more of that conventional gas and was trying to change the rules, and so. Joe, uh, uh, Premier Lougheed created the Crown Corporation, right? And then he had some private sector in order to manage and keep some of that money in the province. I think we can leverage pieces of the Constitution to actually do those kinds of things. That's that's the way that I look at it. But I'm a I'm sort of a pragmatic girl. I'm very emotional. Don't get me wrong. But there's there's cry screaming into the wind is not going to help. And we have broken relationships here that need to be worked on. So I would propose that we put a task force in Quebec and one in Ottawa. I speak French fluently. We have, you know, close to 300,000 francophones here in Alberta, you know, put together this rock star task force that their entire job is to build relationships with the municipal, provincial and federal governments in both of those areas to literally pester them every single day with how awesome we are and how it is that we work on our confederation and potentially even our corridors that are necessary for us to see Alberta and Canada in a whole function I imagine what we're what's capable Chris if you take politics out of it and look at the gifts that we have not only below our ground but the human capital and the diversification that is happening in the sector anyways I mean the oil and gas companies are 10 steps ahead of us as far as environment and environmental controls and ESG I don't know why we're fighting these things why aren't we working collaboratively why does it have to become ideological you know if Trudeau saw Alberta for what we're doing and the actual incredible work that we have a company that can crack plastics right now 
turn it into a liquid and put it into the pipeline with bitumen to remove the condensate, which is value add that goes to, you know, that goes to Chicago that we never get back. It, 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 you know, that's 30% or 40% more in the pipeline that will go because oil and gas is going to be a super part of the mix, at least for the next 50 years. So we just need to talk pragmatically and really, really show the Alberta spirit. And the Alberta spirit has been lost to politics and the Ottawa, the Ontario, that, that pipeline of talent and the ability to be able to share because they have upstream projects that cannot function without our downstream materials. So let's just talk pragmatically about it. Like, do you know why Energy East failed? Can anybody tell you why that happened? It was completely political. And the companies that put money into it, just like they didn't see any forward movement there because the politicians aren't willing to sit down and hash it out and figure out how do we get this done? It's good for Canada, right? Yeah. Same thing with, like, there's just so, I mean, I could talk about this ad nauseum, but the, my, my point is, is that um, if you have, if you go in with the intention of diplomacy, if you go in with the intention of building, if you go in with the intention that what is good for me is good for you, if you go in with the intention that provinces are going to benefit, if you're going to change equalization, equalization, has that, that change in that has to come from all of the provinces. Everybody will benefit from that. But you have to show that benefit. It can't come from, you know, nimbyism and, and your own thing and your agenda and, you know, whatever sort of, you know, destiny you think you have planned for yourself as a politician. You have to go into it from, from the aspect that, yeah, you have to fight back sometimes. Yeah, you have to say those things. We don't attack the very people that are, are your people. You don't call people names. You don't, you know, use the very people that are part of your entire reason for being. I mean, the people of Alberta are my raison d'etre. That's my why. So why would I go and do something that could ultimately hurt the very people that put me into this position? That lens is uniquely different. You're going into it assuming that people are doing things for good. That's a complete and different perspective than the assumption that everybody is bad. You, we have covered a lot in the last hour, oh, 45 minutes almost. But there's probably that one question that someone's going to watch this later on and say, why didn't you ask this question or why, why didn't you follow up on this? Well, we only have an hour and I want to try and fit as many questions as I possibly can in for those who are listening. But for those who are listening afterwards, uh, how can people reach out? And before we start selling memberships here, how can people reach out, get in, like, get in contact with you, ask the questions that they have on their heads? Yeah, so boatlila.ca is my website. Sarah Biggs is my campaign manager. We're a teeny, teeny, tiny little team, folks. We're not the Harper, Jason Kenny machines. We are like grassroots family organization. So yeah, it might take us a little bit longer to get back to you, but please email because we're actually really interested because we are, we're assuming that you're smart and wonderful and have really great questions and really want to build your province and that it's not it's not polarized or politicized. We're really interested in what you have to say because our campaign and our policy is going to be built off what's best for Albertans. So if you have ideas or suggestions, local solutions for local problems, that's what we're looking with. If you're a municipal leader, if you want to get together with us, if you want to hold a town hall, because after today, the work is going to be about making sure that our members know what's going on. And, and just for your knowledge, Chris, I'm not sure what our numbers are right now, but I can't imagine that we're, we're coming up close to 90,000 numbers, maybe if we're lucky. Every person who's listening today, this is not about becoming a UCP member. You don't like just put that aside for a minute. It's a $10 membership for you to pick your premier. That person is going to be running this province for the next eight months. That eight months can make or break what happens in this province, regardless of your ideology or regardless of who you vote for. So that's why it's important. But more than that, there are there are um, people who are even suggesting because you could take a five day, you could take a five year mandate, right? You don't have to do four years. It's in the Alberta Constitution that if you haven't considered, finished your mandate, you could go in for five years. You could end up with this person for twenty two months, okay? Legitimately. So that's the importance here. Don't worry about whether it's a UCP membership or not. That's that's irrelevant. Do you actually voting for your premier? You can be 14 or over, you can be a PR. This is one of those once in a lifetime opportunities, actually. And how do they do that? How can they actually take out a membership for those who are listening right now or listening a little bit later on tonight? How can they take out a membership? Yeah, so just go to votelila.ca um, and you click on buy a membership. It's not an endorsement of me as the leadership. It's just an easy link because we already have it set up. You can go to any of the candidates and do that. And, uh, and you click on buy a membership and you have to put in some of your information and use your credit card and then you are good to go. And that's it. And you become a member and then you get 
inundated with emails and texts and all sorts of fun stuff about all of the members and what they're up to and everything like that. So yeah, fun, fun stuff, my friend. So for those who are listening and watching this a little bit later on, the links to Leela's website and Twitter account are in the show notes. The link to buy a membership is in the show notes. If you want, go out and buy a membership. I'm not forcing you. I would never force anyone to do anything <laughs> against their will. But if you believe in what Leela has talked about for the last 45 minutes, go out and support her. If you believe that you want to have a voice in this race, Go out, buy a membership, do what you need to, because like Leila says, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You'd be choosing the next premier of the province, but it's not for me, the host, to decide. It's for you to decide at the end of the day. Leela, I want to thank you so much for doing this. I know uh, you are a busy woman and even sitting down for this short period of time has been a wonderful godsend to me. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Greatly appreciate it. And I love you so much and I love Ricardo and please, please, please know that um, these kinds of conversations for me are, that's why I'm here. You know, the, the things that people consider difficult conversations for me are about leveraging and building and learning. And if, if I don't get it right, I would really like the opportunity to get it right. It's just really simple for me. So uh, thank you so much for for allowing me this, I sometimes feel very, um, aside from privilege, but I don't, I don't feel often worthy because I know we've made a lot of mistakes. So the fact that you give me this kind of time to be able to explain and justify and participate uh, is very humbling for me and I'm truly honored. Well, I'm always always happy to have you on. And like we said jokingly beforehand, next time we do this, it will be carpool karaoke with the premier of Alberta. <laughs> Uh, so with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in and listening via the Cross Border Interviews website. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, get out from behind social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. I know that seems like a small task, but it makes our democracy better. It makes our society better and it makes us better as a people. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. <laughs>